Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and uh, post this lecture for um, our chapter two, three discussion this week. But uh, before I do that, I want to uh, spend a little bit of time just talking about the outcome of our uh, first midterm, uh, which was was pretty good. Um, now, uh, before I get into that, though, uh, just I want to show you the guest speaker write-up submission. Um, I will be posting here in the next day or two the slides from the guest speaker and the recordings for the guest speaker. So uh, be on the lookout for that in the next few days. Um, you will see that. And then um, also um, I'll be continuing to uh, put our um, quizzes as we go forward, our midterms as we go forward up in this section here. But let's just go ahead and let me click here on the midterm and see how it went. And I, I think we can be pretty happy. We have an average score of an A, 96%. Um, and then, you know, we have uh, some folks that maybe, you know, will be looking forward to the next exam to get up into that A range, but certainly um, very good uh, results on the, um, on the exam. Uh, I will be offering some extra credit opportunity uh, for the guest speaker write-up. So if you found yourself, you know, sort of more in that high B range, you're saying, hey, I'd really like to work towards an A, like is the average for the rest of the class, um, I will provide some opportunity for extra credit associated with the guest speaker write-up, okay? So good work. Uh, keep up the good work. This is, this is um, I think, excellent results uh, for the class. So with that, I want to go ahead and what I'm going to do is talk about two chapters this week and I'll talk about them both here in the same uh, recording. And then uh, what I'm going to do is combine for our practice midterm, um, both chapters two and three. Now, uh, I think that you saw that uh, mastering the practice exams is an excellent, excellent preparation uh, for the exam, and it looks like um, you probably um, availed yourself of those uh, practice exams in your good accomplishment on our first midterm. So keep that up, keep up that formula, watching the lectures, seeing how I talk about the practice questions, practice with those practice questions, study with those, and then you see how that parlays into good results on the exam, okay? All right, so with all that, then I want to go ahead and I'm hoping my pen is not going to make me do what it has decided it wants me to do. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, unfortunately have to uh, try one more time on the pen. Okay, good, okay, good, because I'm gonna be marking some things up. So let's go ahead and get back to that first slide now. Of course, my clicker is going to decide not to work. Okay, here we go. Okay. Nothing like a recording where I don't want to stop and start again for stuff like that. So you get a little extra entertainment that way. Okay. So let's start with um, chapter two. And we're going to, in both chapter two and chapter three, talk about schemes for skimming, uh, or stealing cash based on sales coming in and payments coming in and that sort of thing. So that's sort of the theme that we're in here now. It's a misappropriation of the cash asset really is what we're talking about, okay? So you come over and a theft of cash from a victim entity. So we're talking about the victim entity being the company and basically the in skimming, the cash is going to be stolen before any entry is made into the accounting records. Now we'll talk about larceny theft of cash, but often that theft of cash comes after there has already been an entry in the accounting records. So that's why we have two different chapters, but they really are very closely related. That's why I think it's okay if we talk about them in the same uh, lecture. Now, if something is not on the books, it is difficult to identify because there is no accounting trail to help you to identify the theft. So we're going to see that putting in steps to uh, prevent, right? We have our controls, detective preventive controls, preventative controls obviously would be key in a situation where we're saying it's difficult to detect because there's no accounting records. 
Now, when we look at misappropriation of assets, they always say cash is king. Well, cash is king when it comes to being stolen, right? What's the issue with cash? Once the cash is stolen, it is very preferable. Um, it's easy to take because you can put it in your pocket. And then it's fungible. It spends like cash. And so it is cash. And so it is fairly easy to, you know, you don't have to go through some process of trying to get somebody to take stolen cash. Okay, you can use cash says on there. It's a um, legal tender for all debts, public and private. And so that means that you can go ahead and spend it uh, for anything that you want to acquire, of course, within the confines of the law. And so um, that's probably why cash is the main asset. Other assets, um, you know, non-cash assets make up a smaller percentage, obviously, of um, when we talk about misappropriation of assets. Okay, cash is the most most uh, desired asset. Okay, so what happens um, when there are sales skimming? Okay, the employees makes a sale of the good or services, collects payments. And under skimming, the key difference from larceny is there's no record of the transaction. The employee will pocket the cash at that point. And again, there's no sale and therefore uh, there's no uh, sale in the accounting records and therefore there's no audit trail. That's, uh, again, my point about preventative controls are very key here. Okay, now we can see that there are different ways uh, of manipulating this cash or stealing this cash, skimming this cash, the sale skimming. There's no uh, um, no sale is made in the cash register. So we have cash register manipulation. No sale is made, okay? Or cash registers are somehow rigged uh, so that the sale is not recorded on the register tapes. Uh, that's really kind of talking about an old fashioned mechanical cash register. These days, cash registers are electronic. And so that might be a little bit more difficult or uh, no receipt is going to be issued to the customer. And so the customer can't come back and say, well, wait a minute, I paid for this and I didn't get my good or whatever it is. And so um, these would be ways of manipulating the cash register. If no receipt is issued. Theoretically, there's no uh, recording of the transaction and the employee, the customer doesn't sit there and say, well, where's my receipt? If the customer did that, you know, these days, you know, customers probably just walk out without recording the receipt because they can immediately, without requesting the receipt, because they can immediately look at their phone to see whatever the transaction was, um, if they've recorded that appropriately in, in their um, phone somehow. Uh, so a lot of times there is no register tape these days, but there really should be uh, that will require the transaction being run through the cash register. Uh, after hours sales, so basically allowing someone in after it's already assumed that the cash register has been closed and there's some sort of sale that happens, it's a cash sale and there's no recording of that sale. Uh, skimming by off-site employees. And um, what I tend to think about here is maybe some sort of service or installation of a service of some sort. I don't know. Um, cable TV comes to mind where the guy just comes in and installs the cable and someone pays them under the table for that installment of the uh, cable. And, uh, you know, there goes the cash and the service and the um, product associated with that service, the cable information, the cable equipment or whatever is uh, installed and there's the payment goes into the person's pocket, right? Okay. Um, Poor collection procedures uh, are a problem in that if you are sitting there and you're allowing employees to make updates to the accounting records and also uh, go ahead and collect cash, that would be poor collection procedure. Um, you really should have a situation where there's something has to be recorded first before the cash is collected. If the cash is collected, um, and then the, the, the same person is supposed to enter some of the accounting records, then there that would be you know skimming of the sales because there'd be no entry. Uh, understated sales, so the sale could be recorded, but an amount less 
than what was uh, actually collected, um, reducing the sales price, um, just telling somebody, well, look, hey, give me half the money, just hand that to me, and then you can go ahead and sell this thing, or the quantity of items is reduced, so they're not um, recording some of the sales or some of the sales dollars. Uh, theft in the mail room, and we're talking uh, incoming checks here, okay? Now, um, these days, you know, most stuff is done in an automated clearinghouse, ACH type transactions, but there still are some uh, entities that receive a check payment, particularly if they're dealing with a government entity or something. Government entities often still uh, issue checks to vendors and whatnot. And so uh, if, uh, if the checks come in to the mailroom, somebody could figure out a way of stealing those checks. And then of course, they'd have to figure out some way of altering the check so that they can then deposit it into a bank account uh, under their control. And then of course, they'll never record the receipt from the uh, customer of the vendor won't uh, record the receipt because no cash is received. And then we get into the business of basically having to wait for the vendor to come back and say, hey, uh, where's my cash? How come you didn't, um, you didn't uh, send me the check? Now, um, there are other uh, schemes that might deal with incoming payments, um, but those uh, tend to not be ones that um, uh, would necessarily be uh, perpetrated by or could not only be perpetrated by uh, employees, but these phishing schemes. And when you look at the guest speaker write up, there'll be some discussion about some of those where they go ahead and they say, hey, I'm your vendor and I have changed the uh, account information. So instead of sending your um, automated payments to this bank account, send it to this other bank account. And it looks like it's actually from the vendor. Meanwhile, it turns out that it's going to some sort of um, other uh, account that is not the correct vendor because you have those outside of the company trying to steal. So there is uh, things like that. Or maybe, maybe um, the, uh, you give the employees the ability, and you really should, and it should be at the treasurer level, separation of duties we're going to talk about. You give the employee the ability to change the banking information for any uh, automated clearing house payments, and the employee changes that account to match their uh, bank account. And often, you know, something like this can be happening for a short period of time. They want to see how much they can get away with for a short period of time then they, you know, maybe change it back or they, you know, leave and you don't, are not able to identify them uh, after that. So uh, just kind of moving more into the electronic payment world might be a way of doing something like that. But uh, some entities still do have checks coming into a mail room. So how can we, and obviously preventing is the key thing here because detecting is a little harder if there is no recording in the, um, you know, in these uh, accounting records. So uh, maintain a visible oversight present uh, over um, at any point in time. So you have what you have uh, cameras that are watching the cash registers, um, which of course having the cameras there create the perception of detection, okay? Uh, utilize customers to, and it kind of sounds funny, create the deception of protection, which is a prevention, okay? But uh, using customers to detect and prevent fraud. For example, uh, maybe you have a policy that there is a, a follow-up call on sales. Now, obviously, we're talking about high ticket items where you'd call up and say, how do you like that new piece of equipment that you purchased? Is it working out OK? And you have just a standard call that comes after the sale is made. And it sounds like and it is a quality control customer service type of a call. But it also has what a detection aspect to us uh, skimming sales because of somebody saying, well, gee, uh, 
you know, I got this thing, but I thought it was a free sample or something like that. Or you're you're reaching out to them saying, hey, we, we're getting ready to bill you. We want to make sure that you're satisfied with that part. They're like, what do you mean billing? I already paid for that. I paid cash for the thing. So that sort of follow on way might be a good way to utilize customers to detect. And ultimately, they're knowing that that call is being made prevent fraud. Um, cash register should have login and log out time so we know who was responsible for that cash register during that time. So if there is some sort of cash being taken at the cash register point, um, you would be able to follow up on that and see uh, what happened. Uh, Offsite personnel should be required to maintain activity uh, logs. You know, um, when I have received service at my home, I have noticed that um, often the person needs to come in and, and radio back. I'm now at my next service appointment. And as they're leaving, I notice they need to, again, acknowledge that they're leaving through some sort of communication with the main office. And that is done, um, you know, from a standpoint of, uh, uh, you know, scheduling I, I'm sure that's part of it because we now need to know when because maybe the next customers call and say, hey, where's the cable guy? How come they're not here? Yeah, oh, well, they're just leaving their service appointment. They'll be on their way. So there is that. But it's also knowing where those folks stopped and what was the installation of the equipment, uh, et cetera. Um, also, in that case of where I'm talking about, you know, the offsite location, if it's possible, maybe have the actual activation of the service or something has to happen from a central office and it can't be activated just purely uh, from the site. Um, those sort of things would be ways of um, detecting that. These days, um, using GPS um, and those sort of, you know, tracking those, um, those Apple devices where you can track a person's location and that maybe you require, hey, you're gonna have to, we're gonna issue this uh, AirTag and you're going to have to keep that in your truck and we're going to be able to see where you go and it needs to be active at all times, that sort of thing. So using some electronic uh, means these days is pretty, pretty standard, I would think. Um, eliminating potential hiding places for stolen money, not allowing lockers, that sort of thing, uh, not allowing employees to, um, you know, be able to take things off site the premises. Uh, restricting their ability to carry a purse or a bag of some sort when they're on the floor near the sales registers, all of those sort of things. And then for incoming mail, it should be open in a clear um, area within sight. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the separation of duties and opening mail and making deposits. Uh, as we get into some of the discussion here a little bit later about separation of duties. But um, I have been on assignment when I worked for the federal government where we actually observed to see that when checks come in, the process for opening and they have to be open on a clear glass table so that you can see underneath the table. So you can see if someone's sticking their hands underneath the table. Folks are to leave their hands above the table. There is an opening. There's two people that open the things together. There is an opening person. The opening person opens everything and adds up what the total is of all those checks, passes that to the next person, and that next person reconciles what was uh, entered on that tape for each check that's there and sees that there's an entry on the tape or whatever for every check uh, that came in, and all that information is logged. And there's a couple people there and maybe there's a supervisor who isn't directly involved in that process that is sitting there and watching. So depending, of course, on the materiality of the amount of checks that come in, uh, certain procedures can be put in place. Maybe you're doing that on a daily basis as checks come in uh, to make sure that someone isn't, you know, slipping that check in a bag or something, no bags around that area. Uh, somebody slipping the check into a bag or something, then later on going and fraudulently depositing that in you know, their own bank account. Uh, now, receivables um, is um, skimming is a little bit more difficult to, um, to 
perpetrate than is um, just stealing uh, the cash and skimming the sale. So receivable skimming. And the reason, and I'm just going to go ahead and you know do a journal entry for you, is that at the time of sale, there's a debit to accounts receivable, right? And then a credit to sales, okay? So now the person trying to perpetrate this fraud has the problem that there has already been a recording of the account receivable. And so collection on that account receivable is expected. That receivable is waiting, sitting there waiting to be liquidated so that when the receivable comes in, there can be a debit to cash and a credit to sales. So uh, if the um, payment is received and the customer's account isn't updated because the customer is sitting there saying, well, I paid that. Why are you still billing me? How come I still see, uh, I don't see any payment? on my invoice here, I made a payment on such and such a date, where is it? So uh, the difficulty of doing this is enhanced. And so they start doing some different things. For example, lapping, what is, uh, and we're gonna talk about each of these. So why don't I wait uh, until we get to these, but some of these, and before I start to describe them, so lapping, force balancing, stolen statements, fraudulent write-offs or discounts, debiting the wrong account, document destruction. So we're going to go ahead um, and get into uh, these on the next slide. So let's just go ahead and start looking here at lapping. So what happens with lapping? With lapping, um, what happens is I see that a payment has been made on a receivable. I steal that money. I steal that money. Now I have a problem and that if I don't record something, in the customer's account, the customer is likely to call and start complaining and say, hey, I made a payment. How come it's not showing up on my statement? And these days, you know, folks can often look at their statement instantaneously. And I made a payment a couple of days ago and it's still not there. What's going on? How come that hasn't been recorded as a payment, right? And people can do that via their phone and whatnot. So with lapping, what the um, lapper would do, the, the employee that's stealing that cash would do, is they would go and they would uh, take that cash, they steal it, and then they wait for some more payments to come in and they apply those later payments to the one that they stole. And so the customer isn't complaining and it buys them some time to get some more cash to come in and then apply it to the second account that they um, hadn't updated and they set up, apply that second receipt of cash to that now, um, or I guess it would be the third receipt. They stole the first one. They used the second one to cover the, the step of the first one. And then they, you know, use the third one to cover the fact that they had to use the first payment to cover the second customer and so on. That's, that's the term lapping. Um, and so um, what, what often happens with lapping is individuals think, they think that they're going to take this money that they stole and maybe they steal it on a Friday and they're going to Vegas and they're going to win because they know they've got a horse that's coming in, whatever it is, right? So they take that money they stole and they put it on a horse. So I'm like, you know, um, here comes lucky 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 lapper okay and they go and put the money in the horse and then the horse loses and now they don't have the money to replace the money they stole okay so um we're going to see uh some ways of detecting that uh preventing and detecting that here in the upcoming slides force balancing so what happens i'm sitting there and i know now i have a cash shortage. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go ahead and credit the receivable, debit the cash anyway, even though I didn't receive the cash. And then I'm going to have to have some control over the banking information. So I'm going to be able to manipulate a bank statement to show that that cash came in, even though it didn't. So the bank statement will say we have $10,000 in account, but we actually have 8,000 because 2,000 has been stolen, but they somehow manipulate the banking records to make it look like there's $10,000 in that account. So they force balance. Uh, stolen statements. So again, uh, creating counterfeit statements and whatnot. So at least internally, it looks like the payment has been posted when in fact it has not. And again, eventually the customer will come back and uh, make some sort of um, 
you know, complain about that. Um, and then uh, intercepting the uh, client's uh, uh, address so that they can then send this fraudulent statement to the customer. Now the customer's looking saying, oh, okay, looks pretty good. Uh, looks like my account was updated. Again, uh, much of this can be mitigated uh, through separation of duties. And we're going to talk some more about that here as we come up. Okay. Uh, fraudulent write-off or a fraudulent discount. So what happens, I go ahead and what I do is I debit the allowance for uncollectible accounts. All right. And on accounts receivable write-off and I credit the account receivable. So now, as far as the company is concerned, there shouldn't be any money coming in. The customer made the payment, so they're cool with their balance coming down because they figure, hey, that's just reflecting the payment that I made, and the person steals uh, the money. Now, um, as I've said, we're going to talk about separation of duties and ways of preventing this in a minute, but just let me go ahead and do this one right now. There should be no way that someone who has control over cash or even somebody who has control over accounting records at a relatively um, um, more, uh, you know, manager or even clerk level, okay, that they should be allowed to write off account receivable. That is a treasure function. That is something that the treasure of the entity can sit and look to see that all collection efforts have been made and it is now appropriate to go ahead and write off that receivable. And maybe there's even been some litigation that has been attempted, collection has been attempted. There's been a record of the collection efforts. There's been an aging of the receivable as it's become more and more likely that they're not gonna collect. So there should be a pretty good paper trail that would then be looked at by a high level person in the entity like a treasurer to before there can be a write-off, okay? Uh, debiting the wrong account, um, debiting a fictitious accounts receivable. And then, uh, and so in other words, instead of crediting, um, they, they still would credit the account receivable of the customer, but instead of debiting cash, because they can't, because they stole the cash, they'll debit another accounts receivable. So this might be accounts receivable real customer, and this might be accounts receivable fake customer, and then somehow setting it up so that it looks like it's going through the collection process. They never collect on it, and they just wait for that uh, to be written off. And then, of course, uh, as a last-ditch effort, destroying, altering records, that sort of thing. And by that point, the person's just probably trying to hide their involvement. At that point, it's probably known that something's missing, and they just want to try to cover their uh, involvement in that. Okay. Now, um, ways of preventing, detecting, preventing, okay, preventing, right? Um, maintain vacations. Often what is found is that the person, they seem like the most dedicated person ever, right? And it turns out that the reason that they're so dedicated and don't want to take vacation is that they're hiding, that they're skimming receivables. Uh, supervisory approval. Again, I talked about write-offs being at the highest level, but establishing an account should probably have a supervisory approval so that we can't sit there and create this fictitious account, okay? And make sure that staff are properly trained about the procedures. Um, proactively searching for accounting uh, clues. There should be a separation between the uh, recording of information in the subsidiary uh, accounts at the um, customer level. So if I debit, you know, Burns and Albert and Calero, okay, and I go ahead and I should say debit, I debit the the cash, I credit their receivable. If I credit their receivable account, that should then match to the credits that get entered into the general ledger. And you would have a separate individual or separate department that's responsible for the general ledger versus what the accounts receivable clerk is showing. So then the accounts receivable um, clerk makes those entries. And then there should be a separate that says, okay, when I make the entry into the general ledger, 
I actually need to see that there have been debits to cash, there have been deposits to the bank for these amounts that are getting credited to the accounts receivable, et cetera. Okay, and so this would be a good separation of duty and it's a proactive researching for accounting clues. Um, aging, what's going on with the aging? If an account is 30, 60, 90 days past due, we are to age that and we are to base that information from an accounting standpoint is how much we debit to bad debt expense, how much we credit to the allowance. So using that aging and seeing what the collection efforts are along the way and seeing if the appropriate calls and whatnot have been made. And maybe you have a separate collections department that is responsible simply for following up with customers to say, hey, where is this payment? And of course, if the payment's been made and the receivable has been skimmed, the, per, the customer is going to say, I paid that. What's going on? Okay. And then conducting audit tests, both internal auditors conducting various tests uh, to see that there's the appropriate and really the internal auditors to a large extent are looking to see that the controls have been uh, applied consistently, but they could also do some substantive type procedures that would help them detect some of these problems. And then of course, the external audit process could also identify some of this. Okay, good. So that gets us pretty well through chapter two. Okay, so now we're going to uh, shift and go over to our chapter three discussion. And now we're talking about cash larceny. Okay, now we're talking about stealing of the cash. And you say, well, didn't we skim the sale? We stole the cash. But the difference here is the entry has already been made in the books. And then the cash is going to be stolen. With the skimming, they were trying to take the cash before it actually ever got entered into the books. And then the receivable was entered, but they're trying not to enter the collection of the cash into the books. Here, the cash has been entered, but they're going to go ahead and try to uh, steal it somehow anyway. Okay. Now, again, there could be larceny of cash on hand. It could be a stealing of deposit, and then there are other ways, of course, that cash can be stolen. So larceny is an intentional taking away of the employee's cash without consent. Uh, we can have fraudulent disbursements and cash receipt schemes. Okay, let's go ahead and start to take a look at this. And uh, this can occur under any circumstances at the point of sale from incoming receivables, uh, from the uh, victim organization's bank deposits, okay? Now, larceny is where the money comes from. It is the most common point of access. It happens at the most common point of access to ready cash and results in an imbalance between the registered tape and what was actually in the uh, cash drawer. So we do have a registered tape here. So using another cashier's register or access code, uh, every, and I'm sure you've seen this when you're in a store and whatnot, or maybe you had a client, but this was the case that each time is one cash register, one uh, cashier versus the other, shit changes shift, there's a count of the cash and they can't start to launch transactions there until they log in. And of course, all that login information should be kept, um, you know, private. Uh, death by a thousand cuts. Maybe there's some sort of threshold as to where we start performing prevention detection levels. And so employees know about this and they go ahead and they make sure that any theft is kept under certain uh, threshold tripwire levels. Uh, reversing transactions. So it's a legitimate sale. The money's supposed to come in, but then they void the sale and take the cash associated with that sale. Uh, altering cash accounts or cash registered uh, tapes uh, or simply destroying any documentation as things have been entered. Uh, so preventing, uh, enforcing separation of duties. So let me talk a little bit more. Separation of duties is, and I think we've mentioned this previously, saying that you should separate the authorization from a transaction versus the record keeping versus the custody of the assets. So what happens? Cash comes in, uh, checks, let's say come in, not cash, but let's say checks come in, what should happen? 
the mail room should open those checks, see, open the mail, see which ones are checks and log the ones that have come in as checks, right? That's employee or function department number one. Then what? Then those checks are sent to the cashier. The cashier now is the one that is responsible for going ahead and updating that those cash uh, amounts have been received and preparing any deposit information that will go to the bank and that cashier will then take that money at some point and put it into the night drop box or deposit it or these days electronically scan the checks so that they go in. But it is separate from the person that opened the check and listed on a remittance advice that those checks came in. Okay, then what? Then we would go ahead and for that listing that remittance advice, we won't send it to the cashier. They're going to prepare the deposit ticket, right? But then we have the remittance advice and a copy of the remittance advice is sent to the accounts receivable department, the accounts receivable clerk, so that they can update each client's account. And then another copy of that remittance advice is sent to the general ledger department. And they're going to be looking to enter that total into the total accounts receivable. So if there's a discrepancy between what between what's getting entered in the subsidiary level and the general ledger level, that will be detected at that point in time. Okay. Now, uh, for the deposit, the deposit is made, and the total of that the copy of that deposit slip is also sent to the general ledger department because they know that a deposit should have been made on that day that matches the total that they credited into the accounts receivable. Also at the subsidiary ledger, if we have the listing of checks that were deposited there on that deposit slip, they would be able to check the details associated with that on the, um, on the deposit ticket with the um, you know, information, the details they got for the accounting records, but notice, Oh, and when the check uh, comes in, okay, one of the first things that should probably happen in the accounts receivable department is this legitimate customer, because we don't want the situation where maybe somebody accidentally sends some money to us, and then, um, you know, there's not a customer account that needs to be updated. Well, later on, that individual may come back and say, hey, I sent that money in. And if the money has been stolen at that point, we have no way of following that audit trail. Maybe somebody would figure it out. Hey, this isn't a check for anybody we have as a customer um, and they might steal that check. So authorization, we're supposed to receive this cash. The custody of the asset, mailroom, cashier having separated custody. And the reason we need you know, somebody in the mail room to uh, open that too, is we have a lot of mail that comes in. So we need somebody to sit in the mail room and separate out the checks, make a listing of the checks, send those to the cashier. The cashier will make that listing. Uh, um, the cashier will also list the checks that they have and then distributing those remittance advices to the appropriate uh, accounts receivable, the accounting now, the record keeping and the uh, general ledger. OK, um, there needs to be a reconciliation of the cash register's pay. Again, that goes to the cashier so they know what they're supposed to be depositing. OK, uh, discrepancies obviously would need to be checked and then periodically run reports showing, hey, what are the returns? What are the write offs? Gee, how come this employee is always, you know, um, having so many uh, returns? Maybe they're collecting the cash and then booking it as a return, right? Uh, write-offs, um, as I've said, should be at the highest level, uh, of the very high level, not the highest, but a very high level of the organization, probably a treasure. So, you know, the mantra here is what? Separation of duties. You want separa separation of authorization, record keeping, and custody. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, coming over, we've talked about force balancing. So forcing an account to look like um, the cash has come in when it hasn't, uh, reversing entries, going ahead and initially, you know, debiting the cash, creating the account receivable, and then later on, creating the account receivable, and then um, debiting some other account, like a return or something like that. And then just, you know, the old-fashioned destruction of records.
Okay. Now, uh, cash larceny from the deposit. Anyone who takes the deposit has the opportunity to steal it. But again, if we have what? If we have a remittance advice that's going to be compared against that deposit ticket, then missing, and that is done in the accounting versus the person who had the custody, the record keeping versus the custody, that's going to go a long way uh, towards uh, not only detecting the problem, but if individuals know that someone's going to be looking to see that there was um, you know, a deposit made for every check that came in, that's going to deter uh, the fraud, right? And then a uh, lack of security over deposit before it goes to the bank uh, can also lead to theft. Now, one of the best controls, okay, is a lockbox system. Under the lockbox system, the, we bypass all of this discussion about what's going on uh, with the employees and what they're going to be doing with checks. And payments are made directly. Checks, checks would be sent directly to a bank lockbox system. And commercial banks offer lockbox system. Even the federal government uses a lockbox system. I was on an assignment where we were looking to see what the security was at various lockboxes. And in that situation, uh, tax payments that uh, are to be updated to the treasury go to a commercial bank lockbox. They scan all those checks and they update the accounting records using fiber optics. And that's how the federal government's cash account gets debited as those checks for payments for tax liabilities come in. And it's a huge operation, as you can imagine. A lot of people still like to write a check for paying their uh, taxes, and uh, that is contracted out to a third party. So there is no possibility, at least of your employees <laughs> stealing the cash. Now, of course, there needs to be similar controls of what we've been talking about at the lockbox uh, level. And when I was auditing um, those lockbox procedures, we were looking to see that the lockboxes had the kind of controls that we're talking about. And when I say I was auditing, I mentioned that I worked for the federal government, the um, Government Accountability Office, and we were involved with the request of Congress at looking at some of the securities of those lockboxes that were used by essentially up for IRS tax payments um, were used by the Treasury, by the IRS. Treasury Department was in charge of that uh, to see that those uh, checks were probably uh, properly secured at the lockboxes. Okay. Um, deposit lapping, we've talked about. Deposits in transit. Okay. Deposit in transit, what happens? I steal the cash that has come in uh, to pay off a receivable, I go ahead and I make the proper entry. I debit cash, I credit the receivable, or I give information at least to the uh, accounting folks that that entry should be made if we have proper separation of duty. But then I say, well, that check came in so late in the day that it is going to be um, clear to the bank, you know, the next day or the next accounting period or the next month. And employees know, you know, when the bank statements, what, what periods the bank statements cover. And so they list it as a deposit in transit when you do the bank reconciliation. By the way, bank reconciliation, key internal control. What was the beginning of balance of cash, right? What were the collections for the period? What were the disbursements for the period? Ending balance in cash. But then there should also be what? For the deposits and the receipts, there should be a reconciliation of the balance per books. And if there were deposits uh, in the balance per bank, and if there are deposits that were in transit, those should be added to the balance per bank. And if there were outstanding checks, although we're not talking about disbursements here, if there are outstanding checks, those outstanding checks should be subtracted from the bank balance to match the book balance. And then of course, if there were things that the bank had updated um, from a previous period that we didn't know about, we would adjust the balance per books to reconcile the bank statement. I think you've gotten this far, you know that, how bank reconciliation works. Well, if I list something as deposit in transit, then that's going to explain the difference between the balance per book and the balance per bank. And so we would need to do what? We would need to order or see, I'm saying order because I'm used to being an auditor, but the 
client, the, the company should do what? They should open up that bank statement when it comes to them that next um, that next month and see that anything that was listed as a deposit in transit in the previous month clears the bank in the subsequent month, right? Okay, so bank reconciliation is a key uh, step here, okay? So preventing, detecting, separation of duties. Um, again, I've mentioned some of these already, separation of the mail coming in, the deposit slip with the company's copy of the deposit slip, the remittance advice, the general ledger posting versus subsidiary ledger posting, two copies of the bank statement so that we know that it's not some of some of uh, sort of altered bank statement that's being entered because we are going to be looking to see the deposit and transits and whatnot uh, get um, um, get um, cleared the bank statement the next day. Uh, making sure that deposits are made daily. You don't leave checks laying around, okay? Deposits of checks need to be made on a daily basis. And then not mentioned here, and but to me, probably the best control here it would be just use a lockbox system. And you can, uh, if you use a lockbox system, the company uses a lockbox system, they can ask for certain internal control studies to be done um, that would allow, uh, and, and what would happen is the service entity auditor would provide a report to the company that says, we've looked at the controls at this particular entity and we believe the controls to be reliable etc and uh, they would have a service auditor do that uh, kind of work okay all right good now you come over and let's just take a look at our practice midterm for today hopefully that has not closed on me okay good and as i've said uh, guys, this is both chapter two and three. I don't know if you can see the, the heading up here, but we're going to look at both chapters two and three. And again, uh, don't forget the good job that you did, right? Uh, getting comfortable with the practice midterm um, is the get best way to do well on the actual midterm, okay? So what happens here? And you can see the answer skimming is a theft of cash prior to an ent entry into the entity's accounting system. And we said that, right? Larceny is the stealing after. Uh, in the fraud tree, um, the asset misappropriation are broken down into cash and non-cash schemes, which of the following is not considered a misappropriation of cash, larceny, skimming, Fraudulent disbursements, although we didn't really get into disbursements in our discussion, but that's obviously a theft of cash. Uh, concealed expenses would be away from misappropriation of assets and more towards what fraudulent financial reporting, which we've discussed in our earlier uh, rounds of uh, chapters. Okay. Um, number three, method of skimming sales include which of the following? Conducting unauthorized sales after hours. Yeah, we saw that. Rigging the cash register so the sale is not recorded. Yeah, that's skimming. Posting a sale for less than the amount collected. Yeah, that is skimming. So the answer here is all of the above. Uh, which of the following procedures would not be useful in preventing and detecting sales uh, skimming schemes? Comparing register tapes or cash drawer and investigating discrepancies. Well, if the receipt is never being recorded into the cash register, that would not be very effective. Uh, summarizing the net sales by employee and then um, looking at the top uh, employees with low sales, maybe they're not recording the sale, right? Installing video cameras, yeah, we saw that. Offering discounts to customers who do not get receipts for their purchases. So now we've got all these client uh, customers, whatever clients, customers, they call in and say, hey, uh, I want to redeem my, uh, I want to get, uh, you know, $10 discount coupon because I didn't get a receipt. Ha ha, you forgot. And then all of a sudden we find out that it was all one employee on one day who wasn't issuing any receipts because they're not recording things through the uh, cash register, right? Um, the customer service department at GNC has been receiving phone calls from customers for whom there is no record. This is a red flag of what? Unrecorded sales. 
hey, I just bought this thingamajig from you and it's not working. I need uh, somebody to help me get it to work or whatever, right? And all of a sudden it's like, well, who are you? Okay. Uh, some companies will have a central place where those calls are made so that um, about, hey, I have a question about something I just bought. You know, you call them up and say, if you just bought equipment, you have a question about it, press one and that goes somewhere else. So it's not the same guy who, you know, fraudulently collected and didn't record the sale saying, oh, okay, just press the yellow button on that machine and it'll fix. And then, you know, you never hear about it, right? Uh, number six, a method of concealing receivable skimming by crediting one account while abstracting money from a different account that was lapping, right? The money comes in, you steal the money, you don't update this person account, you wait for other money to come in. See the teams, why they use the term laughing. The other money come in, you apply it to the first account. You wait for the third, you apply it to the second account. The whole time you're thinking, if, you know, if lucky larceny comes in, I'm going to be able to put this money back and I'm going to be a genius, right? That's usually where people start. You know, people start messing up when they think they're too smart. Right. And they start trying to get away with things that are beyond their ability to handle. And that's how they start to get busted out. Um, you know, there should be a reconciliation between when was the money deposited versus when was it received? And if there's a delay between the deposit of the money and the receipt, so the money is, you know, is listed as having been received on day one but it doesn't get deposited until day three and four. How come? What was the delay? Because we're supposed to have deposits daily. At most, there should be a one-day overlap between what's showing as to when it was deposited versus when it was received. You know, we have to wait to the next day to, that, to clear the bank, but there shouldn't be three and four uh, day delays between collection and the uh, actual deposit of the money. And so maybe you've got some lapping going on because they're waiting for that second batch of money to come in so they can cover their um, theft of the first round that came in. Uh, Sue Myers had, uh, was an accounts receivable clerk for an insurance broker. When premium payments uh, were received, she would steal the check for every 10th customer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't she be the you know dumbest thief in the world if it so happened that every tenth check was for five dollars? And meanwhile, she passed up you know the five million dollar check. So you know, I don't know who would come up with this every tenth customer uh, in a liquor store uh, to get uh, and cash it at a liquor store to conceal her scheme. Maybe that's why she's doing every tenth because she's drinking too much and she's making dumb decisions. To conceal her scheme, she would credit the account of the customer that she stole from with a payment that we received from another customer's account. This is classic example of laughing. Okay. Number nine, what is the primary difference between cash larceny and skimming? As we saw, cash larceny is on the books, and they're basically stealing that cash and then manipulating the books to hide that theft. Skimming, they never record the receipt to begin with, right? And we saw the skimming of cash. We saw the skimming of uh, receivables, which had originally been reported. But then when the cash comes in later, when we're supposed to be debiting the cash, we make no entry of that. Uh, where do most larceny schemes involving cash occur? Where the money is at the point of sale. Okay, at the point of sale, when there's cash being handed over the counter, that's probably, um, you know, the best time for the theft. Number 11, uh, what a lot of uh, companies do or many companies do nowadays is they don't accept cash. Um, if you go to uh, a sporting event now, most stadiums, because of the amount of cash that's being handed, uh, could potentially be handing over to vendors and whatnot, they require a credit card because there's just too many different uh, vendors, you know, vendor individuals involved in the cash collection that I'm sure a lot of, you know, uh, stadium venues saw that, geez, this is almost ridiculous, uh, impossible for us to catch something like somebody, you know, pours a beer, takes the cash, and then, you know, receives cash from the customer, and then doesn't book the pouring of the beer that's coming out of a tap or something at a ball game, for crying out loud. So what a lot of 
uh, comp uh, stadiums do now is they make you use a credit card and there is no cash being handed. Uh, number 12, if discrepancies, um, um, oh, number 11, uh, which of the following methods can be used to conceal a larceny scheme that occurred at the point of sale? Uh, falsifying the cash account, okay, yeah. Forcing the balance, right? Destroying the register tape, stealing from another employee's register. Of course, we saw some of the ways and all of those would be ways and we saw some ways of preventing detecting that. Number 12, if discrepancies are found between the sales record and the cash on hand, which of the following schemes might be occurring? Cash larceny at the point of sale, right? They're recording the sale, but then the cash sales anyway aren't reconciling to the cash that should be on hand in that cash register at the end of the day. And probably you would do that at a point of uh, point of collection point, so each cash register. Um, number 13, the most important factor in preventing cash larceny from a deposit is separating the duties. And I think I mentioned that, and, uh, you know, you really want to separate the duties, hire a third party lockbox, get a, a um, service organization control review done by an independent third auditor, require that lockbox to give you that report so that you can see that a third party auditor has signed off and says, yeah, the controls are sufficient for the purpose of collecting this cash. And that's probably the best way to avoid, you know, any sort of uh, cash larceny either by your employees or even by the lockbox if you don't want to trust the lockbox and maybe you don't want to, maybe you want to see that they have the proper controls. Uh, number 14, which of the following computer audit tests would be least useful in detecting a cash larceny scheme? Let's look at all these. Summarizing the difference between the cash receipt report and the sales register by employee, yeah. Um, B, summarizing the top sales producer by employee. Well, the problem there being what? If they're the top sales person, okay? Not to say that you might, might want might, might not want to take a random look at some of the top performers, but systematically looking at those through computerized uh, tests might be a little bit of a waste of time because they're generating sales. They're not people generating sales and then not recording the sales or not recording the cash collections and whatnot. So you might do some random look at those, but you might use your software to systematically look at the lower folks to see well what's going on are they just you know need some training how to improve their sales or is there some sort of you know problem going on that they're not recording the sales or they're stealing any collections uh c summarizing discounts returns and cash receipts by customers yeah why does this person always seem to be the one processing returns maybe it's because it's not returns they're booking it as a return so that we don't call, ex expect the collection of the cash uh, reviewing all unique journal entries in the cash accounts, okay? How come we debited cash on a transaction and the same transaction later we credited cash was then maybe the debit went to another account? How, you know, why does the same, you know, sales invoice number have a debit to cash and then a credit to cash in the next journal entry? That sort of thing. Number 15, Jan Ashley worked for the RS department store as a sales associate in the fine linens department. As she would give back change to a customer for cash, she would also pull out a $10 bill and slip it into her pocket. I don't, I don't need to laugh at some of these schemes. <laughs> you know, I would think you'd want to steal a $100 bill, but okay, go ahead and slip a 10 in. Maybe this is death by a thousand cuts, right? She concealed her scheme by issuing one false refund at the end of her shift for the amount she stole that day. Oh, I see. So this is death by a thousand cuts. So she's taking the $10, $10, $10. And then, you know, she does that 50 times. I guess she got 500 bucks and then she processes one return, okay? And then uh, what is this? This is what larceny at the point of sale. This is actually... Uh, recording the thing, but then going ahead and stealing at the point of sale and then making an adjustment later to cover the theft. Uh, Dorothy McNally stole 232 from the company's deposit while on the way to the bank. She can conceal the theft by recording the missing amount as a deposit in transit. 
Of course, we should look to see that that deposit and transit clears on the next bank statement. And if it doesn't, you're going back to what's her name, Dorothy, and say, hey, what happened? Okay. All right, good, guys. Uh, so hopefully that is a helpful discussion for some of our points in chapter two and three. I'll keep up the good work and I'll be posting up our next round of lectures here uh, in the next week or so. Oh, and keep an eye, uh, I'd say in the next day or so, I will be posting up the guest speaker lecture. So I'll, and I'll be giving you some more guidance on that.